My name is uh, Erik Gutmann. I'm a senior experience designer at DICE in Stockholm. Uh, and this is uh, UX maturity at DICE, a bottom-up approach to UX buy-in. Uh, when I named this talk, I tried really hard to find a catchy title, like, you know, how to put yourself out of a job as a UX designer. But uh, I've come to accept that my clickbait game is, is weak. I shouldn't be a YouTuber. So here we are. You're stuck with this master thesis sounding title of a talk. Uh, but I hope you'll enjoy it. So let's jump right in. Now, let's see if we can get this working. There we go. I find myself in a very privileged position of working in games, uh, as I'm sure some of you viewing this talk uh, do as well, right? From massive AAA productions to indie darlings all the way to mobile. In my world, we all work on absolutely awesome things, right? Regardless if you work in games or not, when it comes to how we work with UX, we all have sort of our own stories and struggles, our own scars and our own victories. And I think we've all found ourselves uh, somewhere between sort of total despair and feeling like absolute rock stars, sometimes even in the span of a single day. Now at DICE, some time ago, we were at one point in our journey of awesome, in a sense. And today we're at a slightly different point. And that's sort of what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about how we work to take that journey. And hopefully you'll find it valuable on the journey that you go on as well. But let me start a little bit with why I wanted to give this talk in the first place. You know, like at places like this, at DevGam and all these uh, fantastic conferences, you always meet so many great developers that share their stories about how they work and the struggles that they face every day. Uh, everyone has their own story and their own struggles, like I mentioned. And it's really, it, it's a privilege, I feel like, to, to learn so much from all these people and talk to them. So I felt like it was about time that we shared a little bit about, about uh, our experiences as well. And I think it's also really important that, to have that understanding that we're all talking about these journeys and that we're all on them, right, in a sense, uh, when we communicate across studios and across teams. Now, I want to preface my words today with saying that this isn't really a talk about the UX maturity model. You might have seen a bunch of them, right? Defining numerical values for how integrated UX is in a given organization. Uh, these models are great. They can be really, really great. I think they are a super valuable tool when discussing UX inside an organization. Uh, there's a lot of great presentations, articles, and materials about UX maturity, but this isn't one of them. Uh, what this is, is the story of how we got better in working with UX at DICE as a studio. It's the story of how we work to continuously improve the way we work with UX. And I wanna stress that this isn't just my journey, right? We were already on our way when I joined. I've sort of just joined on a trail already set out for us. So it is our journey, but from my perspective. So a few things uh, that we're going to cover in today's talk. We're gonna go on a journey together where we talk about designing for UI down to designing for experiences, all the way down to designing for emotions and how we progress as a studio and as a team with working with all these different areas. But to give you some more context on what it is I'm going to talk about, let me introduce you to where I work. Uh, for those of you that don't know DICE, uh, we're a game studio owned by EA, located in Stockholm, Sweden, uh, the country of uh, laundry times, as I've learned, uh, founded in 1992. So DICE, we've been building uh, awesome experiences for quite a long time. In fact, this year DICE turns 28 years old, which is pretty insane when you think about it. Uh, incidentally, 28 years old was exactly how old I was when I decided that I really need to be making video games. So I signed up to join this very same studio at that time. Feels like a long time ago now. So over the years, the studio has shipped quite a few games, which has given us a lot of opportunity to reflect on the way we work, you know, where our strengths lie and where we can improve in the process of building all these great experiences. And as you can see, DICE has quite a mix of experiences in our DNA, from pinball games, racing games, all the way to horse games. But what we're probably most known for is our series of battlefield games, right? Now, I've been here personally for almost eight years now, and I've had my hand primarily on battlefield during that time starting off with leading the design team on the mobile commander app that we did in Battlefield 4, and then taking over as a lead UX designer from Battlefield 1 and forward. So as you can see, in the relative sense, my footprint in the studio is quite minuscule, right? But I'm still, I'm really honored to have had the chance to take part in even a small part of this journey. So let's dig a little into how we're structured around UX at DICE. 
it will help us have a better understanding as we continue talking more today. To set the stage then, uh, let's begin with the classic UX is everything outlook. Uh, this is a way of looking at things which is helpful when talking about sort of the importance of user experience in a, in a, in a product as a whole, but it doesn't really reflect how you work in reality, right? Now at DICE, similar to other big game studios working in AAA games, we're spoiled with being surrounded by tons of specialist groups that play key parts in the development of our games. For example, we have a dedicated user research team and a fantastic test lab in-house where we can regularly test and validate our games as we go. This means then that this aspect of UX is not something that the UX design discipline needs to invest as much time or effort into. We just ask and the UX research team delivers. It's awesome. Uh, similarly, we have great marketing organizations that helps us understand who our players are and what motivates them, right? All of these things are incredibly important parts of any dev team, right? And something we are generally quite spoiled with as AAA developers. But as you can see as well, many parts of what traditionally you would look at as UX work, right? It's not something that UX designers in our studio are working with on a daily basis. Uh, in fact, a couple of years back, I, I started reflecting whether, you know, is there really still a place for UX designers in AAA game, game development? Uh, you know, maybe we don't need dedicated UX designers to deliver high quality products anymore. This might have just been a spout of existential crisis on my end, but what really triggered my thoughts on the subject was working with all these talent specialist groups that do the job that a traditional UX designer would be accustomed to doing. Talking to users, understanding who they are and evaluating how they use our products, right? Uh, on top of that, we're surrounded every day with all these amazing talents, like for example, audio designers that are obsessing over every little, every little detail on, on how the weapon sounds, for example. All these things which contributes greatly to the uh, game as a whole, right? And I think other UX designers that work in games, they can probably relate to that feeling of being compartmentalized to the UI people at some point. And I think the reasons I mentioned above is, is part of what happens. But as I think any UX designer working in games or game developer in general will tell you, having all of these awesome resources uh, doesn't automatically lead to great UX. A good friend of mine likens the development of AAA games as sort of demolition derby with Ferraris. We have all these great resources at our hands, uh, but when we put them all together, it can sometimes get a little bit messy. The result, the end result is often quite enjoyable and people tend to love it, uh, but as a bystander looking in, it can look a little bit crazy as well. Uh, now then, back to DICE and where we were at a while ago. Uh, we weren't in the most horrible state uh, when, uh, when it came to UX in general. We had people thinking about UX way before I joined the studio as well, right? And as I mentioned, in games, you naturally have people across the entire team thinking about the experience regardless of what the role is. But as with most places in the industry, UX wasn't in a super mature state a few years back either. We didn't really know what to do with it. So get, that gets us sort of to the real question then. How did we improve the UX maturity and experience of our games as a result? In order to answer that, I want to introduce you to my little pyramid. It's pretty empty right now, I know, but don't worry, we're going to get there. I don't want to spoil the ending for you. You can think of it, though, as we go forward through this presentation as sort of a Maslow style pyramid tailor for UX. Uh, we're going to start with looking at the top. And I know it might sound completely strange and backwards. The topic of this talk is literally like a bottom up approach. Uh, but wait, bear with me, it, uh, I hope it's all going to make sense in the end. Now, as I mentioned, in organizations where UX hasn't really grown to maturity, you'll often see UX designers mainly working on UI. Right? And before we start drilling down into the pyramid, I want to zoom out a little bit and take a moment to recognize something. In games, we're, working, we're not working with banking software, right? Delightful visuals and UI in games is absolutely key to great UX. Sometimes, we get stuck a little bit in this conversation about just doing UI as if UI would be something of less importance. And these are good conversations to have when talking about how it can become more mature and really sort of uh, using all the muscle that UX has. Uh, but remember that it's okay to be inspired by great looking UI. Inspiration can be both visual and functional. And it's important that we keep this in mind as we go forward, that success in games UX comes when you have that muscle on both ends of the spectrum, high usability, 
exceptional UI art coming together to be sort of greater than the sum of their parts. It's that combination that leads to great AAA UX. So that's a, a slight side note. So let's go back to the pyramid then. So as UX designers though, and I'm sure you can think about this if you're working within UX yourself, we believe that designing UI is only part of what the sort of value is that we can contribute to the process and a product and a company in general, right? We believe though, that in order to create these great UIs, we need something more fundamental to stand on. But I think we have to ask ourselves, why do we struggle to do more than UI? Why is it that this happens? And if you find yourself in a place like this, as we did as well, some, to some extent uh, a while back, let's look at some of the things we did in order to shift away from that situation. The challenge that we often found ourselves in was this sense of gap between UX designers and other design crafts like game designers. It's not that we mistrusted or disliked one another, it's quite the opposite. We just didn't really know how to utilize each other's skills properly. I think the reality is that UX has over the years established tons of methods and language, especially as all these schools and education around the craft have started popping up. And in the same sense, game design has been on a similar journey over the years. So sometimes we just end up speaking different languages while wanting to say the same thing. What we really needed at the studio was a shared language, something to help cross that divide. I think a very, very important aspect of working in design is building relationships with the people around you and identifying how you most effectively can communicate with each single individual that you interact with. Because just as with our players and, and your users, each individual is unique. And a huge part of the work is figuring out what is the unique things that works best for them. Now, traditionally, the sort of holy grail of communicating with any type of stakeholders in UX is to get them to hold a pen and to draw on paper to start getting thoughts and ideas from our heads and their heads down to artifacts that we can actually start talking around. And there's so many great methods written about this subject on, on sort of working with paper. I'm not going to drill into it. I think it can be great. Sometimes pen, pen and paper, though, uh, while sort of seemingly harmless to look at, can be quite intimidating tools in the eyes of some as well. So I think it's important that you, you spend the time figuring out what the right tool for the job is. Sometimes it will be pen and paper, great. Uh, other times, what you need is somewhere where people maybe can gather their thoughts more asynchronously while they have their own peace of mind, where they're not in the stress of a situation where someone is staring them down and telling them, come up with great ideas now, right? In fact, I got the question just yesterday, actually, uh, from someone that was just starting uh, studying towards a UX degree. They asked me, you know, what, what software should I be using? What software should I learn to get into UX? And my answer to that is really don't put too much value into learning specific software and specific tools, right? What you need to do is focus on understanding how the tools and the software can help you build this shared language, right? Focus on the type of tools you need. There's a there's hundred different hammers, right? What you need to focus on figuring out is the fact that to nail down a, a nail, you need a hammer and not a saw. That's the first step. I'll take a side note though, and say that uh, in that conversation, and whenever I speak to someone that asks this type of question, Specifically in games, I always say, uh, spend some time learning the engine that you're working on as well. Even if you're a pure UX designer spending time on research and on paper, there's nothing more valuable than understanding uh, a little bit of the engine and the technicalities that you're working. Because in that journey of creating a relationship with the people you work with and the shared language, if you can speak a little bit of the language, understanding how things are built, nothing will beat that. Now, today, if you would ask me, the tool that me and my team uses the more than anything is Adobe XD and Miro. Uh, these are great tools with very low barriers of entry that anyone can quickly feel comfortable, you know, jumping into and visualizing ideas without really any prior knowledge. And I think especially in these strange sort of working from home times that I'm sure uh, some of you uh, are experiencing as well, having real-time collaboration in a digital format is a really great tool. But I also recognize that next year, there might be new tools out there that we'll be using instead. Again, the importance is how we use them to find this shared language. Let me give you a concrete example from uh, Battlefield. I'll use the gamer presentation as an example of how we work in this way. Now, getting new players to understand the game modes in the Battlefield games has always been a challenge in the franchise. And given how many veteran players we have that find the rules of our, our more classic experiences like Conquest, like a really holy, 
we have a fine balance to strike between communicating existing complexity versus you know, not overwhelming new players and veterans alike. So what we did was to sit down at the very, very start of the project together with the game mode designers in this case, and we conducted design exercises where we together worked to visualize all the rules of our modes in UI, in XD in this case. And importantly, we were not there to redesign any rules or systems. We were simply there to help visualize existing designs in a way that players could understand. And I think sometimes something that really helps is if you can find a starting point in systems that already exist, that just need improvements, it's way easier to engage and visualize those together instead of starting it from a completely blank slate, especially in these early conversations when you're trying to build trust, trying to build that relationship. I think doing this together, it shaped a dialogue between game designers and UX designers where we could look at all the systems in a more visual way we could talk around them and sort of where to draw the line in terms of what can and can be not be communicated in UI. Now, word of advice, don't come in swinging thinking you can save everything with UX, especially when you're at this stage in your journey. If you are sort of in the early stages of getting trust and, and buy-in for UX, it's a surefire way to get absolutely stuck in the process. And I've seen it happen many times myself with eager UX designers that want to prove their value, right? It really helps to stay humble recognize that everyone is there to make the best possible experience and that you're there to create that together. What you really want to get to is that feeling where you, people see UX as sort of the air support, right? Something that they can rely on to help them get out of a sticky situation. So that's sort of trusty, reliable watcher. Now, the more buy-in for UX you have, the easier it is to exist in this sort of realm while still making significant positive impact to your product. Uh, one way of thinking about this working relationship that has helped me a lot. It's something that I stole from a great talk given by a few designers at Bungie a couple of years back. They introduced me to something uh, they called the experiential ecosystem. And it's a way of how we're looking, uh, how we all work towards delivering experiences that really help me in communicating with my peers and other design crafts around how to best interface UX designers with a larger team. Uh, in the experiential ecosystem then, you begin by looking at user experience as the entire product experience. This works really well in industries where people working with UX are maybe the primary product designers. But as game developers making entertainment, our definition of UX might need to be a bit more specific than in other product design industries. If you're working uh, doing UX in industries other than games, you might not even have other designers. You are the core designers. But in the game industry, the role of game designer already exists. In fact, they existed and were designing product experiences long before the role of UX had even been established in the industry. So when you're collaborating with game designers, it's valuable to distinguish the user experience from the player experience. Now, UX here relates to the experience the player has within the UI, whereas the player experience is the broader term used to describe the overall gameplay experience players' emotions, motivations, all these kind of things. And the success of our work as UX designers, as we'll see, relies a lot on those factors. Finally, there's also customer experience, which is the experience the customer has with all of the products and services combined. So that's uh, websites, companion apps, customer support, marketing, all that kind of stuff. And all the parts in this ecosystem, they come together to shape the overall experience the players have in our games, right? So. Thank you so much to Jamie, Jennifer, and Oliver at Bungie for presenting this. It's been really useful for me when I've been talking to, to my team about this kind of stuff. So to kind of sum up that section a little bit as well, uh, focus on finding that shared language and be humble while you're doing so. Don't come in swinging thinking you're gonna save everything at this stage. Focus on building that relationship with your peers, with game designers to find where you can provide value in the early stages. And think of talking about it as this experiential ecosystem to figure out where you exist in the greater picture of the game's product. The end result of this, for us, has been in part changes to how we visualize existing game modes. But most importantly, uh, the result for us has been that game mode designers, they now consider how players consume information much earlier in the design process. Instead of just handing it over to UX and, and assuming that communication to the player will be just taken care of, or even feeling like they're not even allowed to do it because UX owns the presentation or things like that. Instead, we can now work in a much more collaborative manner. And I think importantly, it's also led to a much wider understanding in the studio of, of just not being able to solve everything in UI. And that onboarding is a critical aspect to these things as well. 
You can see it, for example, in the game tutorials we built in, in Battlefield 5 a while back, where we teach uh, these uh, core rules through gameplay and not just through the, the game on UI. Okay, then. So when you have a better understanding in your team around how working, uh, how you can work with UI and how players consume information, I think it allows us as UX designers to lift our eyes a little bit and look at the product more holistically. And I think of this as being able to start designing for experiences. So let's dig a little bit into what that means. Now, an important stepping stone in getting from designing UI to designing experiences, at least for us, was being able to take a proper stab at the information architecture of our games. Now, information architecture is really an entire science in and of itself. I'm not going to sit there and say that I'm an expert in the field because it really isn't the case. Uh, information architecture is sometimes seen as simply another word for UX, which isn't the case either, but there is certainly a lot of overlap between the two. Uh, I read an article a while back, I don't remember where, but it had this great quote saying, every good UX designer is also a competent information architect. And I think that is the key. With the expert knowledge that you can possess as a UX designer around how humans process information, you have a lot of the tools already that you need in order to start shaping a great information architecture. Now, for our sake in games, information architecture really comes down to how we structure the information of flows in our games. And a very common classic artifact for this is something like what we're looking at here. It's a screen flow. I think this one is from Battlefield 1 at some point during development. And we've been doing this in, in various formats in the studio. Well, the thing that they often had in common was that it generally became screens flows and not necessarily information flows. Now, depending on where you work, this might be created by game design or UX design, and there's nothing wrong, right? The important thing is that it's being done. I think the important thing is that UX designers, as we now just mentioned, tends to have a pretty good understanding of information architecture. So it makes sense to leverage that skill set towards structuring these flows. The thing is though, that as designers, and I think especially UX, UI designers, we tend to be quite visual thinkers. So it's only natural that we start thinking about screen flows. It, that's where we live. Uh, we have all of these uh, amazing uh, artists that might already be concepting uh, what a screen might look like early on in the projects. So it's very easy to start running in that direction. Uh, but I'm here to tell you though, that that is definitely a trap. It's a trap that I have fallen many times in myself. And as a result, we've ended up with solutions that appeared way further along than that they really were, right? Which in turn lead to these really expensive changes at the base, sort of when we start changing the base structure of the game. It also limits our ability to be creative and innovative as we paint ourselves into these corners of screens way too early. And at least I think most importantly, it limits our ability to improvise in the design and the development process, which I think is one of the most critical skills designers can possess. So how can we work around that and how do we get away from thinking about screen flows and screens and instead of moving towards thinking about how we structure information instead. The best way that I found of communicating these flows while avoiding screen flows is to work with breadboarding. This isn't a new concept for UX and you might already be familiar with it. If you're not though, in short, it's basically a way of working where you focus on finding the elements instead of deciding how those elements should fit together. It's inspired by these breadboards that you see on the screen right now, these electrical sort of circuit breadboards that you might have used in school. I know I was stuck with them in electrical class many years ago, where you basically just put components down and you hook them up to see how things start to function together. But you're not really thinking about how they're going to look, what material they're going to use and these kind of things, right? Uh, it's all about what the components you need are in order to make it work. So let's look at a quick example of how that can look then in, in, in a game. This is a example of a boot up flow from a game. Uh, what I generally try to do here is to group the information into beats rather than just screens. It doesn't matter at this point if, for example, a calibration flow in this case is this one screen or five screens. It's not the point of this exercise that you're doing. It's all about figuring out 
what information and which choices the player does at these different beats and on this different journey in order to get the most effective flow where the player is making the right decision in the right point, they have the right uh, tools for the job in each step of the journey. And I think this isn't important just for great UX, but it's also really critical in you know, figuring out and talking to early st tech stakeholders, for example, as they are trying to figure out what solutions needs to be present in different parts of the game. For example, where in the game can players purchase things? Or where do we need to update a player inventory to the back end? All of these things can be informed by a well-structured breadboard without needing a single screen design. And it helps get you this alignment way earlier so you can spend time where it matters and stuff. OK, so what does all this around information architecture, this quite dry, non-visual thinking, what does that have with designing great experiences? Well, in short, it's all about time. If there's one thing that I've come to learn in my years working in games, is that the people that we surround ourselves with are deeply passionate, capable, and willing to create amazing experiences. The biggest factor that holds them back most of the time is time. The time that we are spending to debating over flows that are uncertain, and the clearer that you can make the use of the game, the faster you can get alignment and actually meaningful sign off on things, which means more time spent iterating on the quality of the experience instead. You can think about it as a sort of speed of iteration in any classic iterative loop, right? The further you move on in the process of development, the more people get involved, the slower the turnaround becomes. And when you're making changes early on, less people are involved, the cost of change goes down, and you can make uh, changes just drastically faster. And that translates to time spent doing things to quality instead. Now, I want to show you a short video clip from Battlefield 1 that I think gives a good example of when this process worked really well. We're going to take a look at the operations game flow and how it looks like when you join a new game all the way from the menu into game. So please take a look. April 1915, the Allies begin their major combined arms offensive against the Ottoman Empire. Their ultimate goal, to control the sea route from Europe to Russia. The first step in that plan required the control of the Dardanelles, a narrow waterway leading to the Turkish capital, Constantinople. I have long realized that the ambition of my life has been to go on a great military campaign. With dawn, I see that wish fulfilled. Thousands of us wait quietly in the hull of this old collier ship. A Trojan horse, ready for the Ottomans with our sharpened British steel. I saw the maps that the commanders are using. They're from the Crimean War, over 50 years old. How many times will I see the sunrise over a battlefield? <laughs> this old dog might be getting too tired for war. After this campaign, it's time to call it quits. Soldiers, today we seize the beating heart of the Ottoman Empire. We seize Gallipoli. At dawn, we storm V Beach at Cape Ellis. From there, we take their fort and supply stores at Sed El Bar. Then we will push forward and take their coastal batteries at Morto Bay. Our final objective in this region is to take the high ground at Karakala. Stay strong, soldiers. Victory is close at hand. I'm actually really happy about how the operations experience turned out here. The team, they really aligned around a clear vision and they worked to execute it in the best way possible. And I think that because we drew out those speeds really early on, and we agreed on what each step needs to do. And then we kept to that agreement largely, at least throughout the project. 
we could spend that time shaping it into an experience that I hope really connected with players and bringing them on this journey. Of course, as anyone working on these things, there's a million things I would do differently if I could go back. But still, I'm actually very happy with how it turned out. Now, there is, of course, more to designing for experiences than just solid information architecture. Uh, I choose to focus on that here in order to just give you something tangible that you could spend time on that really makes a difference, I think. Uh, assuming you're not just stuck designing UI for things that others have already designed for you. But hopefully, we've solved that. Finally, then, we find ourselves at the bottom of the pyramid, the sort of foundation to this hierarchy, uh, which should ideally then be used to inform all of the things above it. But it's also the thing that probably requires the most amount of buy-in in order for you to spend time on. When discussing UX, we often talk about how players feel when experiencing our games or products, right? But less often, at least myself, have I seen designers really spending time on defining that aspect of the experience. And I, like I mentioned, right, this is definitely more tricky to define a value proposition of if you don't have previous successful uh, things to lean on. So it's a good idea to use the steps above it as sort of a, a foot in the door in order to get UX evolved early enough in the project to have an impact in this area. There's also an important note here, right? Experiences and emotions can't be designed, but they can be designed for. And it's important that you look at it through that lens when we talk about these things here today. So let's take a brief step back and look at why it makes sense to me to have this designing for emotions as the foundation as for your work as a UX designer in games. First of all, emotions are crazy complex things. This is maybe the sort of no shit slide, but here's the deal, right? When I talk about designing for emotions, I don't mean designing for dopamine shots, love hormones, or anything like that. There's a lot of bad material out there around how we can manipulate and control people and how they feel through design. And I encourage you to really keep a very critical eye when you come across material like that. I don't pretend to understand the complexities that goes into human emotion either. The reality is that in general, we have a pretty limited understanding on how it works. Nevertheless, as even Donald Norman, the sort of grandfather of UX himself points out, the emotional side of design may be more critical to a product success than its practical elements. And as game makers, creating emotional experiences is really at the core of everything that we do. So how do we relate this to games UX? The best example I've seen of mapping emotional design to games UX is in Celia Hoden's book, The Gamer's Brain. This has become quite a popular recommendation in contemporary games UX, so you might have already heard about it before. But really, it's worth giving another shout out because it's great material. Now, Celia defines the components of game UX in general as usability in addition to the term engageability. And I'm not going to deep dive into the term this talk. I want to look a little bit, though, at what she writes as important for this term, engageability. So Celia, she breaks these, uh, the term, basically, into three different categories. Motivation, emotion, and game flow. Motivation, of course, motivation is at the origin of all human behavior. Uh, and ultimately, engagement is all about motivation. Emotion and game flow, in turn, they both contribute to motivation. So these are things like how you award the players, what is it that drives them, and, and many other things. Emotions, then. Emotions, they serve motivation in the sense that they help us choose the right behavior. Uh, Celia, she uses an example that is, for example, you flee when you're feeling scared, right? Uh, and then finally, game flow, it's that state of deep focus and immersion that you might have heard in a lot of game theory and, and game design. It's so super important for engagement and quite often as a normal concept used in games. So then because of our ability as humans to be so affected on, on many layers, cognitively as well as physically by emotions, it's really important uh, how we, we think about emotions and how we shape our experiences, right? So as, as Celia uh, mentions in her book as well, how it feels to play a game the surprises that are offered, the overall emotions that you evoke, they're all super critical aspects to games UX. 
And I could sit here and I can speak to this at length. It's a super interesting subject. But the best thing I can do for that specifically is really just point you to, to her book and, and other materials on the subject. There's tons of great stuff on, on this topic. Uh, what I want to spend some time on talking about is how we uh, started to looking a little bit in the studio uh, around how we can utilize and designing for emotions in our design process. Uh, it's something that we talk about as defining emotional targets. So what do I mean with emotional targets then? Well, in the earliest stages of a project, right? If you worked on any bigger game project, we often define these various important goals and directions that sort of outlines the type of games we're trying and setting out to build as a team. Design pillars, style and tones, player motivations, there's all these pillars that we look at. Uh, and these all are, are meant to sort of drive in the same direction and deliver on the type of experience that we have set out to promise our players, right? And none of these things, they, they should come as news for anyone working on these type of projects either. But I wanna to touch upon here is sort of how we can utilize the specific skills of UX to help amplify these early sort of stakes in the ground, right? Specifically then around emotional design. So what we can do as UX designers and really designers on the team in general, I would say, is we can sit down together and identify a certain set of emotional states that we wish that our players find themselves in. And then we can help amplify the direction of the game by making statements around how we work with our features and the communication of those features in order to drive those specific emotional states. Uh, there's no magic process to it, like that thing, even though uh, games, of course, is always a little bit of magic. It's really just lots and lots of talking and discussions, which is why it's so important that you spend time building uh, relationships and a way of to communicate with the different parts of the team, right? Sometimes it's just about translate the things that you've already stated in design pillars and style and tone. And other times it might be about designing them from scratch. What we do then is that we take these emotional targets and we turn them into user stories, talking about, you know, how you could feel as a whole when playing the, this, the, playing the game. And this isn't narrowed down to a specific part of the game, like how do I feel when I get this specific reward or anything like that. It's rather the way we want you to feel in the experience as a whole. So we can take these user stories and then we convert it into our UX direction and guidelines. And how do we do that? Uh, let me give you an example. So for example, if one of the key pillars of your game is say an open world that is worth exploring, an emotional state that you could uh, sort of strive to get players feeling is that in this game, I feel invited to explore. So what does that mean then? What are the things that you can do in your game, be it through the menu design, progression system, or maybe even the world itself in order to drive that emotional state in the player? What are some of the psychological effects that you need in order to reach that state? Maybe perhaps, you know, even now we can start to make statements around what type of experiences we create. For example, maybe we, we make a progression system that makes players feel comfortable in exploring by not locking them on restricted path or, or not allowing them to change uh, their mind halfway through, things like that. Maybe we create tools and environments that invites, invites the player to experiment so that they can feel comfortable in exploring all these different features in the game. Or maybe we create information flows that are shallow enough so that they don't take a lot of cognitive load so that you can spend that energy and feel like you're safe to go on a journey and exploring. You're not getting stuck in a place because you, you drilled deep down and now it's really costly to go away from there, for example. Oops, sorry. Uh, these statements, they, they sit on a layer of detail deeper than the initial game direction or the creative direction but they should always sort of work towards amplifying those things uh, in order to drive towards the experience you're trying to create as a player. And personally, I believe that there's so much opportunities here. I think it's a space where UX designers can actually really provide some actual value early, early on in any product and specifically game projects. I think there's a secret sauce here of great game design, psychology, cognitive science, and just like pure creative vision all of those things coming together to deliver on that promise of like a truly great and enjoyable experience. I think there's really something there in order to get that AAA feel. 
But I would say it's also important to recognize that their emotions are influenced by cognition, right? Cognition being things like what we see, what we hear, what we smell, all the cognitive senses, right? That's why presentation is also super important, like great looking UI, as we mentioned. So while it's important that we get to spend the time to define the foundations, like these emotional targets that we just talked about, sometimes I think it's important to recognize that the smallest details can make the absolute biggest impact. Uh, I'll share a little feature from Battlefield 1, which I take absolutely no credit for. It's all thanks to the amazing uh, audio team in this case. Uh, some of you might even recognize it. Ooh, it's so good. So that's the headshot sound specifically from Battlefield 1. And for me, it goes to show how important is uh, and how important cognition is specifically when making players feel. That's such an incredibly satisfying sound. And it, it together with the entire loop of what's happening, what's feeding back, that little detail is what creates that AAA polished experience. All right, then. Uh, let's take a look at what we got again, the full picture this time. So the components that we talked about in this hierarchy, they might not be new to many of you. But I hope the way uh, of looking at these in this order, they can help us think about how we can work from the bottom up in game teams in order to utilize all the good things UX can bring to the table. So from a starting point of mainly designing for UI, we managed to grow the impact into designing for the experience as a whole, all the way down to being able to spend time on setting the foundations for emotional design for the game. Uh, now, here's the kicker then. When you are able to attend to these lower layers of the pyramid early enough in a project, you'll get everyone in the team to think about UX as a more integrated part of the project. Creative directors, for example, they can feel comfortable knowing that the emotional targets that you've defined together, they are used to inform design decisions that drives towards the intended game experience. Uh, game designers, they can feel comfortable and empowered in thinking about how to work with how to present their systems and they'll have a better understanding about what is suitable to present in UI and what belongs to the player experience as a whole. And finally, and importantly, UI designers and UI artists, they'll be more confident in creating just fantastic looking screens because they'll know that the information has been thoroughly uh, researched and explored and that the decision that are underlying those things uh, sits on a solid and robust foundation that they can rely on. And hopefully then, Going forward from here, uh, as UX designers, you'll find yourself involved right from the start in your next project. All right, so that's basically the journey of DICE. We've gone on quite a bit of one. Uh, it's been a few years, and we're still going on that journey. We're in a good spot today. Uh, of course, there are things we can do better, and I think it's super interesting to hear uh, where you are at in your journey of this. I think at DICE, uh, we're all about moving forward from where we are today. Even though I'm happy about where we are today, some of you watching this, you might have been on this journey a long time ago, and you find yourself already further on. Some of you might be just at the beginning of this journey. Uh, again, at DICE, it's about just moving forward. So a little bit from my end of things we're going to focus on uh, and, and sort of where we're at. First, I'm super happy about the fact that we've gotten the chance to grow our team immensely as we sort of got more UX buy in the studio. I now have seven full-time UX designers on my team. It's amazing and it's an incredible growth since the eight years ago that I started. Uh, this team is then supported by a talented crew of UI artists and technical designers and other craft helping to develop both amazing UI and more, right? One of the most important things to me going forward that I think we need to spend a lot of time on that we're struggling with still. And if you played any of our games, this probably resonates a little bit with you, is doing some actual proper onboarding for our players. Uh, the great thing is that when you have proper UX buying in your studio, it's so much easier to push for experiences like the little one we added with DF5 a while back. And once you start doing that, you get the numbers and you'll see quite clearly how much that impacts just players staying longer and, enjoy and enjoying your experience more. Uh, another important aspect, I think, is moving the needle forward for accessibility in, in our games and, and games in general, right? Uh, we have continuously improved throughout the years, uh, but we still have a long way to go. There's uh, absolutely uh, nothing to shy away from there. And I think, though, we're going to see sort of the industry recognize more and more that games are for everyone. 
And from our perspective, importantly, it's possible to create experiences to provide that type of gaming for everyone without compromising the hardcore competitive gameplay that also a lot of our players are after, right? That you can sort of contribute to both or you can provide for both. And then I think another important stepping stone, which when you start to get more mature in UX and you have more buy-in, is to grow that UX skill set outside of just the craft. If you want to get to that space where you're feeling like UX designers is the air support that can kind of come in and be reliable and help out to provide all this expert knowledge, it helps when you can get uh, the studio as a whole, game designers, scripters, and artists to think about what it means to work with a UX design approach to pretty much everything that we do. Uh, in short, we're only getting started. We're on this journey. Uh, it's been a super exciting journey so far, and I can't wait to take it further from here. Uh, and that's me. Thank you so much for listening. I think I'm going to turn to the chat now and see if there are any questions. Okay. Uh, thank you, Eric, for such an awesome speech. And uh, this speech was not only awesome in terms of information, it also was a motivational one. <laughs> I think a lot of... Um... That's great. Great to hear it. Yeah. I think a lot of game designers will be motivated to learn something new and to expand their borders, their knowledge borders. Uh, the first question what I want to ask to you is, um, uh, you mentioned the process of UX design and you mentioned the uh, map. Uh, it looks like a customer journey map for me. Um, yes, <laughs> I, I saw it a lot of time in inter enterprise development. And um, you know, uh, in uh, practical work, uh, when you design such maps uh, to communicate with your team, uh, you see that um, your team don't don't understand uh, such schemes and such maps, and uh, you all need to visualize uh, to them. Uh, but your point was that. Um, when you think in terms of windows, in terms of uh, some sort of uh, visualization, you limit your creativity and you limit your ways to find the best solutions. Uh, uh, so how you feel you can manage this conflict? Yeah, I think th this is a constant struggle and, and a balance that's really hard to strike. I was in a meeting literally earlier today where someone was presenting an idea for uh, a new design and, and they had a small little, very rough mock-up that they had made, and then a bunch of bullet points underneath that was outlining how it worked. And immediately they started getting questions of like, is this gonna work? And is this gonna work? And all of the answers were in the bullet points below it, but he hadn't covered it in the little mock-ups. So people got confused immediately. Uh, so it's a, it's a really hard balance to strike because I think as humans, we are very visual thinkers. So it's very, very easy to, to get it. Like you, you look at something visual and you immediately sort of understand it. Uh, but I think that that's part of the growing the sort of maturity in a team in a studio is you sort of practicing and getting into that set where you where you don't have to think visually. That's why I, for example, really love those breadboards because the breadboards strike sort of a middle ground where they are more than just bullet points. They are more than just a, a journey of text, right? You can still sort of hint and start drawing conclusions to what it might turn into on a screen, but you're not trapped in the discussion of like the bar is on the top left or on the bottom right of the screen. <clears throat> so I think it's about finding that middle ground. Yeah, yeah but middle ground is is more complicated. Is uh, the most complicated thing <laughs> to, find, <laughs> to find this point. Yeah. It, uh, it, in my experience, it's always the clash of uh, the parts of the <clears throat> team of the people. One of is a uh, more visual thinker, and another is just he can just write the text and understand the uh, text that others write. Yeah. yeah. Another point is um, also about the team and uh, the collaboration of developers. Uh, that you said that uh, this framework, uh, I think they can name it as framework in your pyramid. Uh, this framework uh, is targe uh, it targets uh, not only the development team, but also stakeholders, but also people who um, make the decisions, the uh, final decision about the game. Uh, and uh, in my experience, and the experience of many of my colleagues, uh, the higher people said, 
uh, the law they care about details and the law they care about uh, some uh, um, uh, how would say how the players think they, they mo- most most of the, they care about is they care, starting to care about money to production value uh, to reach uh, some business goals etc etc so how you think um, this such a framework will address uh, the communication between development team and uh, this kind of people. Mm. That's a very good question. Because um, they, uh, they, they, despite, despite they don't think uh, about player, they uh, uh, made the, the most uh, you know, influential decisions <clears throat> in game development process. Absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> and that's sort of the, the, the coveted UX seat at the table that everyone wants to get to, right? Where you have enough buy-in that you can actually make an impact on that. <clears throat> and I think on the creative side, on the creative leadership side of things, this model helps a lot with getting to engage with people like creative director or executive producers or the people on the team that still sits close enough to the product. Like uh, I, I used the example of the game pillars and, and then the goals, right? So I think the point with building upon those and getting to yours, for example, emotional targets and getting down to the information structure and UI, they can see that journey. Uh, it's much harder when you get to the point where you're saying, like when, when, you, when you start to engage with something that's maybe outside of creative, like the, the uh, CEOs or the, the, the people that makes the money decision, right? Uh, as a UX designer, and that's not something that I maybe covered here, I think one of the most effective tools you have for that is impact mapping. Uh, and uh, we don't have time to go into all the things that impact mapping mean there. But it's a very interesting, I, I would suggest to, to for anyone that's interested in, in wanting to make an uh, impact on the, that side of things, like the non-creative, but like the product and the business side, being able to, as we mentioned, right, it's all about finding a shared language. That's what it's all about in the end. So you need to think about, you're talking to these people that think about maybe not how awesome it's going to feel, but how many players are going to play and how much money they're going to spend, right? So impact mapping can really help find that shared language where you're still talking about the user experiences, but in a way that maps towards their line of thinking around how many are we going to lose if we don't do it this way, for example, right? <laughs> yes. So we always have to translate it in terms of money. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And oh, okay. Um, I have the last, very last question, and this question uh, you already share an awesome book. Uh, I just immediately get to Amazon and to order this book. <laughs> yes, because I don't, uh, haven't read it uh, until now. And uh, do you have uh, some other books to share to the people on DevGa? Maybe you, you think must have to read for a game designer? For a game designer who wants to get into for, more for UX, game designer, for, for, Yes, or... for a game designer, yes, designer, game developer, I mean. Mm-hmm. There's a book I read recently that I really enjoyed. Uh, it was called Experience Required, How to Become a UX Leader Regardless of Your Role. Uh, it was a really interesting book that talks about, like, even if you're a game designer or, or a QA tester or an a audio designer, how can you make UX impact by, again, finding the shared language, talking about the process, things like that. So that was one that I found really useful in, in studios where maybe you don't have as much UX buy-in. So that's definitely a recommendation. Okay, thank you very much. That was a very nice lecture. It was very thank nice you so much. You here. Good luck. We got one more question in the chat as well, actually. Oh, the uh, ah, <laughs> uh, could, could you read it? Yes, of course. Uh, so what are, from your point of view, diffs in game user emotions? So, for example, cinema pictures emotions. Ooh, that's an interesting one. Uh, I mean, it's it goes into what's the difference between game and cinema, right? And at fun, on a fundamental level, it is because in games, a player affects their choice. It's not just about consuming the experience. It's about actually affecting that experience. So I think that's by far the biggest difference because there is this sort of give and take relationship where the actual player is giving input and the game is feeding back based on that, uh, which provides fantastic opportunities when you're thinking about, for example, emotional design, because you can, as a game, then react on how the player is actually inputting in your game itself. Yeah. So that's it. <laughs> we get no more questions. <laughs> <Good>. Thank <laughs> you, everyone. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs>